Hey guys, we are the Latter-day Disciples. Our team is dedicated to helping you boldly live the gospel, recognize the signs of the times, and prepare for the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us in our mission through our daily and weekly podcast series, connecting with us on social media, and visiting latterdaydisciples.com. We pray you are enlightened and empowered through this podcast episode. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Latter-day Disciples podcast. I'm so grateful to be joined today by Dave Butler. Dave is not an academic. He has been a lawyer, a consultant, a corporate trainer, and a registered investment banking representative. And he is now a consulting editor for Bain Books and part owner of a business that designs bespoke e-learning. Dave also writes fiction, principally science fiction and fantasy, and principally for adults. His 18th novel was published in January 2024. His books have won the Dragon Award, the Whitney Award, and the Association for Mormon Letters Award for Novel. In early 2021, Dave co-curated A Desolating Sickness, a literary response to the COVID pandemic that was displayed in BYU's Harold B. Lee Library. This semester, winter of 2024, for the second time, his novel The Cunning Man, co-written with Aaron Michael Ritchie, which in July 2022 made the AML's list of 100 works of significant Mormon literature is being taught in a Mormon lit class on BYU campus. Dave takes the position that the Book of Mormon is an ancient document and also that the Book of Mormon is a work of temple literature. The Nephite prophets were members of an esoteric lineage that wrote for an audience that they expected to possess eyes to see and ears to hear. And the intended way to understand the meaning of their writings is to read through the lens of our own temple experience. He embodied his early thoughts in this vein in a pair of short books, Plain and Precious Things and The Goodness and the Mysteries, both self-published under the pen name D. John Butler. Dave is currently hard at work on his third book on the subject entitled In the Language of Adam. He hopes to bring this book out in spring 2024. Dave plays guitar and banjo whenever he can and hangs out in Utah with his wife, their children, and the family dog. Dave, thanks so much for joining us today. Megan, thanks for having me. If I had realized you were going to read the biography, <laughs> one. my apologies. You know what? It's actually not the longest bio I've ever read on the air. Okay. So take that as you will. I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, but uh, okay, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Well, Dave, we were talking just a little bit offline. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. You've had some really incredible episodes come out on other platforms. I particularly enjoyed the two episodes that you did with the the guys over at the Stick of Joseph. Absolutely phenomenal discussions. Um, And in my studies, you know, our platform, we tend to be diving in a little bit deeper to the scriptures, looking at things from a more esoteric lens. And I've I've found the Lord leading me to places that it seems you've already traversed for maybe a decade plus at this point. And so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk with you. Can you give us a little bit more background about you and and particularly as it relates today, um, you are kind of a unique voice in that you are a man who is really championing the divine feminine and the rediscovery of the ancient Israelite tradition of a heavenly mother. And so I'd love to hear how it is that God led you to that study. Yeah, that's a that's a big question. Um, that I think that is a fair characterization. That is not um, that is not the road that I uh, thought that I was walking when I started. So um, I I thought that I was going to be a um, uh, a fantasy novelist when I was a kid, right up until, um, I don't know, some point in college. And, uh, and then I thought for a brief period that I was going to be an academic and have a career somewhere in kind of the, the ancient biblical world, classical world kind of space. But then, um, I decided I wanted to get married and specifically to a girl named Emily and she didn't want to be poor and that seemed fair. <laughs> so, so I instead went to law school. A good remedy for that. Yeah. Well, it's a, it is a <laughs> common punt. Uh, it is true what they say that you can do a lot with a law degree and you can make a lot of money. 
The piece that they tend to leave out is that if you borrow a lot of money, that leaves you effectively a slave. You are mm. in debt servitude to the big firm. <laughs> uh, so, the fine so, print on that. Yeah, it, the, that is the other side of the devil's bargain. So, mm -hmm. so I got my degree in Near Eastern Studies. I'd done a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Greek. And then the thing is that I rode trains for six years, Okay. So I rode, um, well, first of all, in law school, uh, not that I was too smart for law school, but I was never all that interested. So after the first year, I sort of found myself kind of bored. And so I would do what I called Dave school. And, and I, I amused my law school classmates by having stacks of books on dead languages in my law school locker. And I would go play basketball and then I would come into the library and I would sit down and for like the first couple hours, I would study classical Egyptian and Anglo-Saxon or whatever. OK. Uh, and then I uh, and then for six years, five years in London and uh, a year in New York City afterwards, I was working at a big firm and I and I rode commuter trains. Minimum two hours a day. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes more. And, uh, and so I read, and so I had this kind of protracted, uh, period of self-instruction, I, I guess, initially it was sort of just, uh, reading whatever kind of reading that had come out of my degree in Near Eastern studies, reading that related to my general interest in, in, uh, the biblical world reading springing from my general sense of the inferiority of my own education and the need to like, supplement what I got at the university. Um, but at a certain point, I got sort of channeled into reading about uh, reading about the apocalyptic literature and the intertestamental periods. So I got really interested in um, the uh, books, books like uh, First Enoch and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And there's a there's a constant sense reading that that there's something there and that I'm not seeing it quite and maybe they weren't seeing it quite either. Maybe the people who were writing this were holding on to things that they were that were old memories and they were sort of forgetting them uh, and, and, and they're beginning to be buried by time. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I got interested that way in the the literature of heavenly ascent. Mm -hmm. So uh, might have been Martha Himmelfarb's uh, books on heavenly ascent, um, where uh, she talks about. I think this is where I got the idea that that heaven that 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 visions describing an ascent through heaven could be actually descriptions of movement through a physical sacred space, which is to say specifically Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the classic ascents uh, up through heaven, um, uh, something like uh, first Enoch uh, 14 and 15, um, typically end in a, in a throne vision, mm -hmm. right? You see, you see uh, God on his throne, which is God on the ark or the cherub throne in the Holy of Holies. Uh, and, um, and, and in some uh, uh, radical, crazy uh, versions, the, the person who is ascending seems even to sit on God's throne, right? Um, it's sort of, the, sort of the classic example. And, and I started, uh, and I had no platform, and I had no... I was working at a law firm, you know, sort of 60 to 100 hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I had callings like elders quorum, second counselor. I've never had any callings of meaning. Okay. I, <laughs> my best, most responsible calling ever was I was a scoutmaster in Manhattan. <laughs> in this, Megan, this is kind of a, this is an experience I've had many times where I can. I have a, a feeling that there, there's something here. I know I'm looking at a piece of ground, at a text, at a at a vision, and I and I know there's something there, 
and and I and I can't see it yet. And I have to keep kind of worrying it and 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 thinking about it and playing with it sometimes for long periods of time. And I think that's the 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 right brain mm-hmm. part of your brain that assembles that that is conscious of everything all at once and the relationship among the things, but it's it's not in front of your vision. You can't mm-hmm. see what's there. So mm-hmm. your right brain is back there working on stuff and you can just I can feel my right brain is seeing patterns, but I can't get it in front of my left brain yet, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Well, th- there are some obvious temple visions in the Book of Mormon. First Nephi 1 is obviously uh, not just one, but two temple visions. And that's that's like the, that's the slow pitch over the plate. I was on um, Rick Bennett's, program and i said to him look people who say there's no temple in the book of mormon are just silly yeah you can disagree with with the amount that i think there is but like the throne of god is in first nephi chapter one so you're you don't see the temple you are not paying any attention yeah so uh but but I, i had a particular like the feeling of um First Nephi 8, this was ultimately kind of my door into all this stuff. I just could feel it that First Nephi was a temple ascent, was a temple vision. I couldn't quite figure out how, right? So mind you, I'm not sitting in like a cubicle in a university thinking about it all day and discussing with my colleagues. I'm riding a train and reading books, and then I'm going and drafting prospectuses and negotiating indentures and traveling to warsaw to read due diligence documents right that's what i was so so uh so maybe somebody else would have been in a better position than me but i was the guy there was so um you and i have talked about i i i know you are aware of the work of margaret barker it was during this time that i first encountered her stuff i think it was originally a review of her book the great angel and it might have been by dan peterson Back in like 2002 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and so I read the great angel. This is great. And then I, and then I sort of steadily started reading everything of hers, you know, as it came out. So she was part of that kind of like stew of stuff. Right. So, um, so this is, this is sort of the background and I was still studying languages. I'm not a linguist, right? I am not. I am a guy who has persistently gotten back on the horse of studying Hebrew and Greek, thrown off because life gets too busy, get back on the horse, thrown off, right? That's been happening for 30 years now, right? So I have some pretty mediocre Hebrew and Greek abilities, but it's enough to like read the Bible, it turns mm-hmm. out, because you 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 need some, actually, mm-hmm. or, or, you, or you're really fettered. Right. So... So this was kind of my, this was, this was my way in as I was trying to figure out, I am pretty sure the Book of Mormon is this temple book, and I'm pretty sure First Nephi 8 is somehow part of it, and I, and I can't see it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, then I got called to teach elders quorum in Eagle, Idaho, and um, they agreed with my radical suggestion that I would teach whatever the heck I wanted. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Yeah. suggestion or or i the way i heard it it is it was kind of a a a demand <laughs> yeah i basically explained how i would do it and they yeah. said okay um which which is which was brave of them uh, <laughs> and this was uh 2007 or something like mm-hmm. that and and then for the next 10 years, I basically taught elders quorum across a series of four wards and did it the same way all the time. And, and this gave me a forum for like exploring ideas and pushing. Um, and and I, think, I think the impetus that pushed me to sort of on, on First Nephi 8 is there, this has to do with Margaret, actually. There was a mm. farm published a kind of a weird, weirdly formatted, like sort of magazine size um, soft cover books, this big kind of floppy 75 oh. page hmm. book or so was uh, like a review of Margaret Barker's work. I, I don't remember who wrote it, but I remember there was a footnote that said, although first Nephi eight 
uh, has some some temple symbols, it is clearly not an ascent vision. And I just this is wrong. And so <laughs> I, uh, that pushed me to kind of put together for for in the first place an elders quorum lesson on why or uh, how first Nephite is a is a, a vision of an ascent through Solomon's temple. So here's the overall thesis. Here's my overall point of view. Okay, mm-hmm. what I have come to be very convinced of. Um, Nephi and Mormon and Moroni and Alma and all of the principal Book of Mormon writers. Okay, there may be some who are not, like maybe Zenith is not. Okay, but basically all the ones you think of, Jacob, these people are temple worshipers. They uh, they practice. Uh, an ascent through the temple, a liturgy, a rite, an ordinance of ascending through three-part sacred space that is very complex. The mythology of this ordinance is the expulsion from and return to Eden. Mm -hmm. So worshipers play the part of Adam and Eve. They are thrown out of the garden and they must make their way back. And they start in in terms of Solomon's temple or Nephi's, which he says in 2 Nephi 5, it's built after the manner of Solomon's, not as fancy, he says, but after the manner, which I think means, you know, with respect to the ordinance, it accomplishes the same thing. It's got the same shapes it needs. So they start on the porch in the presence of two pillars that have lily work. They're arboreal pillars, they're trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, they experience the expulsion from the garden, um, and they begin the road back, which includes being led by a series of angel guides, uh, taking on commitments, um, uh, having a feast of the, well, having a death and resurrection experience, having a feast of the Lord's flesh and blood, Mm -hmm. and then being, uh, presented at the veil where they ask, seek and knock and enter, uh, and and build their house upon the rock, which is, I think there's a lot of reason to think that the climax of this ordinance was they sat on the throne of God or did something very similar to that, mm. okay? Um, in the presence of the one tree, which is the tree of life, which was the menorah, whose, whose proper position, as we know from Matthew 7, 1 Nephi 8, Revelation 22, and other texts, is behind the veil in the Holy of Holies, not mm. in not in the main room. Mm -hmm. So the Nephite prophets did this. They have this in common with Jesus in his mortal life and in common also uh, with John, for example, who writes about this stuff. Uh, And they, and they did this and um, self-consciously as part of a movement that dates back at least to the prophet Isaiah and takes a, a mandate from Isaiah about how they should preach. Uh, Isaiah, uh, I spend a chapter, I've talked before, and in this new book that's coming out in May, I've got a more detailed chapter talking about Isaiah's calling. Mm-hmm. But um, Isaiah lives in a very important time. There is He lives in a time of an apostasy, specifically against uh, what in sort of contemporary Mormon parlance we would call mother in heaven. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, he has different language for it. Uh, but Isaiah uh, leads the, is the first prophet of the underground resistance. And Isaiah gives a mandate in the form of a prophecy uh, as, as to how we're going to communicate and prophesy uh, now that we um, kind of echo Alma 32 in the Zoramite Poor, now that we are thrown out of the building, mm-hmm. now that hostile forces, uh, the, 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 those who mock wearing very fine clothing have captured uh, uh, the temple and have smashed our precious symbols, um, what we'll do is we will prophesy in a way that they don't understand. Their eyes will be blind, their ears will be deaf, their hearts will be fat. They will not understand. And Isaiah, and and Jesus quotes uh, Isaiah in Matthew 13, he describes himself as as fulfilling that prophecy, as following Isaiah's method. And, and, And I think the method of prophesying or communicating, what Nephi calls the method of prophesying among the Jews, not of the Jews, among the Jews, Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is to prophesy 
using the language and the doctrines and and the images and the sounds and even the tastes of the temple experience to communicate your idea the result being that some people in your audience will understand what you're saying because they've had that same experience and some people won't mm -hmm. and those who won't will not be harmed by what you said they won't be spiritually responsible for it and also they can't come after you because they don't realize what you've just preached mm -hmm. right so um so the book of mormon is that the book of mormon is uh they self-identify as the visionary men nephi says in the very first verse of his account because ha having known the mysteries of god therefore i write these small plates mysteries means uh um a long form ordinance mm -hmm. with a mythological drama at its heart where worshipers perform the ordinance to gain salvation or other kinds of spiritual benefits right mm -hmm. nephi says in the first verse it's so crazy that this is that anyone takes this like news okay because mm -hmm. if any if there's any verse that we all should have read it's first nephi 1:1 Right. I get it if you didn't read much further, but like that's the first verse. But he says, I am a temple man, having known the mysteries of God. That's why I'm writing the book. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately shows back to back visions of the Holy of Holies and then proceeds for the rest of the small plates. And in fact, the whole rest of the Book of Mormon as we have it, the prophets talk in terms of. Um, uh, they they use the imagery uh, of their own experience of those ordinances to communicate what they're talking about. And so mm -hmm. when we figure out that imagery, it changes what they're saying. And also we can we can start to understand more and more what their ordinance was by what their language implies about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's so that's sort of the that's the framework. Now, the divine feminine. Turns out, <laughs> turns out this really matters to Nephi. Okay. Um, how do we know that? Because his father sees a tree of life. And Nephi prays and says, I want he prays for the Holy Ghost. I want to, I want to understand this. And the Spirit of the Lord appears to him. First Nephi 11. And, and he tells the Spirit, I believe everything. I want to understand. I believe everything my father saw. The angel, the Spirit of the Lord shows him the tree. It's the same tree. Uh, and the tree is white and beautiful. And Nephi says, uh, I want to know what the tree is. And, and the Spirit of the Lord shows him a woman who is white and beautiful. And, and, and it says, you know, behold the, the mother of the Lord after the flesh. And so people go, oh, it's Mary. Except that it can't just be Mary. Mm -hmm. Because Nephi says it's the tree of life. And he even talks to his dumb older brothers in 1 Nephi 15 and tells them it's the tree of life. It is the tree of life. Mm -hmm. It is also a woman. Right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and Nephi says, she is precious above all. First Nephi 11, precious above all, and then gives us a whole chapter length. Originally wasn't a chapter, chapter divisions have changed, but a big fat discussion of how hostile forces are going to take all of the precious stuff out, hmm. right, of our account. So um, there's there's a, a number of big passages, at least, at least several big passages we could talk about. But I think the sort of high level thing is uh the divine woman in the temple was the great object of controversy for uh the reformers in the kingdom of judah and by reformers i'm putting scare quotes around reformers because the because if you call them reformers you're accepting their version of the story okay uh the people who wrote the record ultimately liked the kings of Israel who hated the divine feminine, okay? And they didn't just hate the divine feminine. They hated other things too. Mm -hmm. And and maybe we can come back to that. So for, for Nephi and the Nephite prophets, the divine feminine is like is this 
is this huge thing that they're constantly telling us about. It, it's really interesting to just, just step back from the Book of Mormon to 30,000 foot height and say, what does the Book of Mormon obsess about that is not obsessed about in other scriptures? And the, the answers are very interesting. Adam and Eve. Hmm. The Book of Mormon obsesses over the, the Eden story. The Nehushtan, okay? We can talk about this. The serpent on a pole that heals is referred to four times. I looked this up on Wikipedia last week. Wikipedia has an article on Nehushtan, and it says, oh, the Book of Mormon refers to the Nehushtan twice. Wrong. Four times. Mm -hmm. Okay? Not even counting what I think are two clear references in the Isaiah chapters. Mm -hmm. So it may be more like seven or eight. Four times. First Nephi 17, second Nephi 25. Alma 33, Helaman 8, the Nehushtan. It gets one mention in the New Testament. What, one or two? I guess two in the Old. It's made in Numbers 21, and then Hezekiah uh, destroys it in 2 Kings mm -hmm. right? The Book of Mormon is obsessed with it. And the Tree of Life, the Book of Mormon is obsessed with this woman who is white and beautiful, who is the tree that is white and beautiful. And by the way, both Nephi and in 1 Nephi 11, okay, the angel says, or the Spirit of the Lord says, Blessed art thou, Nephi, which is the beatitude formula, Ashrecha, O oh, your happiness, Nephi, and, and Lehi, who says the tree was desirable to make one happy, which is, which is Osher, okay, they're both punning on the name Asherah, which is the, which is the, the name that we have in the Old Testament for the divine woman that Hezekiah and Josiah uh, uh, assaulted and for mm -hmm. which they got so, so much praise, right? Mm -hmm. So for, yeah. for Nephi, these are, this, this, is the, this is the most precious thing, uh, mm -hmm. and it keeps coming back in, 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 uh, in Jacob in an astonishing way. Uh, and Alma over and over again. It's just this is this is one of the one of the ghosts that haunts the Book of Mormon. And well, look, I don't have a call to action, but I think that it's sort of at the edge of our vision in the Book of Mormon, and that makes me feel like somehow the way forward is that way. Like that's that's part of the set of things we're going to have to figure out before we get any more of the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. any more a, a resumption of revelation, right, mm -hmm. in the way that we experienced it in the 1830s. Right. So, um, so I guess that's a statement of my thesis. Yes. Um, I would love, are there specific things you want to talk about? Yeah, well, I mean. What do you think? Uh, well. Maybe you're a quack. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I do think that, but mostly because I think I'm a quack. So, oh, you know, enough. we're in good company with each other, but um, no, I, I, I level with everything that you just said. So a little bit of background on me and our, our audience may or may not know this, but um, it was in 2023, the beginning of 2023, yeah. I was praying for sanctification through the year. That was my intention that I was trying to set. And within a day or two, the Lord came to me and made it very clear that the answer to that intention, that hope, that desire, that becoming that I wanted to go through is that I needed to know my heavenly mother. And before that point, I have, I was never interested. It never was on my plate, even as a woman, like it was, it was something that I never thought about. I wasn't worried about it. Um, but it became, it was so clear to me in that moment that that's what my answer was. And so I went forward and I started studying, right? Started looking for these things. I took a course by Mandy Green, who's a friend of ours. We've done a podcast with her. She has some beautiful work about discovering Heavenly Mother in the scriptures, which I think lines up really well with kind of what you were, what you were presenting about how Isaiah set this standard for the revolutionary divine feminists on how to keep records that would preserve her in a way that no one knew. Um, because if they knew it would have been destroyed. And so she goes through a lot of the scriptural record and she pulls on those threads. She pulls out the sermon on the Mount blessed 
Asherah, right? There's a, there's a hint of that there. There's pointing to a heavenly mother element there. Um, she referred to a lot of Margaret Barker's work as well. Margaret Barker is the foremost scholar on this topic, I think, globally. We actually had Margaret come and speak at a virtual conference that we held back in November. And it was such a gem to have her do that. She's just one of the sweetest women, I think, in the whole world. And so I'm fairly new to this study too, but somewhat like you, I feel like the Lord has made it very clear to me that this is where I need to go um, for myself. And and I've been feeling particularly lately, anyone who listens to more than one episode will probably know that this is the thing that the Lord has been sitting on my heart that we've been needing to talk about. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about your thoughts expanding on that last comment that you made that we're seeing her in the book of mormon we're seeing these preservations of her we're also recognizing um that there are things that the book of mormon prophets were trying to preserve and teach that clearly we have not had restored in a fullness yet um and i think the the serpent on the fall is kind of a good example of that other than the divine feminine because this was the thing that that moses raised up in the wilderness as a representation of jesus christ for the people to look to and be healed and then later we see king hezekiah and king josiah casting it out and destroying it melting it down taking it out of the temple what does that mean like that that's a huge red flag in other ways and so then seeing it tied to this idea of the tree of life i think is very significant as kind of a last thought and then i'll let you talk Um, that interpretation of the tree of life where Nephi is with the spirit of the Lord and he's showing him, look, this is, what is the meaning of the tree of life? He sees the woman fair and beautiful and white. And the angel says, knowest thou the condescension of God? And he says, I know that he loves his children, but I don't know all things. And he sees her. He sees the mother of the son of God after the manner of the flesh. And then later on, the angel hearkens to it again. He says, behold, the condescension of God And this time he sees Jesus Christ. And when we read that, typically I think we're like, oh, he's just like setting up the story of the condescension of Jesus Christ. I think that's true. But in another layer, you see that there are two condescensions. There's a condescension of a feminine and there's a condescension of a masculine and they are a mother and a son. Hmm. And as I read, uh, I've been studying lately the verses that say, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in God Somehow this time it read to me, neither is the mother without the son, nor the son without the mother mm. in the Lord. And so there's a there's a connection here that we've completely overlooked that I think you're hundred percent right. We need to we need to grasp this or else we're not going to progress in our own temple experience, right? Because we are supposed to be coming to embody the temple. It's not just this edifice that we go to to perform outward ordinances, although that's important. It's very educational for us, but the temple is supposed to be a lived experience, a transformation that we're going through. And if we took, if we don't have her in it, we're not going to get it. So with that said, I'll, I'll kind of pass it back over to you. Yeah, the, that's interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm just doing the last polish through of a book that comes out in May and you almost verbatim quoted like the last two lines. <laughs> I talk about the no tree without the fruit no fruit without the tree um yeah so uh yeah the book of mormon is surprisingly non-institutional it's not really mostly a book about being in and working in churches Mm -hmm. it's mostly a book about spiritual renegades who have to run away from those who are wicked and uh have to find ways to worship as the zoramite poor uh, learn from Alma and Alma 32 when they don't have access to the building, which is, is a tre- tremendously fascinating thought. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I have no call to action. Um, the uh, the Nehushtan is an interesting kind of canary in the coal mine, right? Mm-hmm. So Numbers 21, people are being bitten by snakes. Uh, God tells Moses, uh, put a seraph up on the pole. And when he says that, Numbers 21, 8, he doesn't say uh, a burning serpent, which is what the King James says. He just says a seraph, a burning one. That's it. Mm -hmm. So people, um, scholars tend to think that the seraphs are snakes. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, I think that's probably right. Hmm. So, uh, so the, there's a seraph in Isaiah 6 that appears. It comes down from above the throne. So it comes out of the Holy of Holies. And there are two of them. And again, commentators have suggested that, that if that vision is based upon the things Isaiah knew in his own temple experience, that means there are two Nehushtans in the temple. Mm. There's all kinds of reasons why that's interesting. Um, without getting sidetracked into it, the Nephites clearly know Jesus as a serpent, and they also clearly know Satan as a serpent, so mm -hmm. that there would be two serpents on a pole in the temple um, is very consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when a seraph comes down and burns Isaiah's mouth, um, it's probably not a shiny person. It's probably a six-winged snake with hands that flies down. And it is the Nehushtan. And it is quite clear from uh, 1 Nephi 17, 2 Nephi 25, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that it is Jesus. Now, we don't know for sure what Isaiah thought. I suspect that's what he thought, too. But for Nephi, that seraph coming down to call Isaiah is Jesus. So Hezekiah smashes Jesus. That's what 2 Kings 18.4 tells us. And when the Nephites talk about how wonderful, you know, about the the serpent that was raised up and it healed people and it can bring you in the same way, look upon Jesus, Helaman 8 says this, in the same way that people in the desert looked and were healed of snake bite, you can look at Christ and be healed and have eternal life, right? Mm -hmm. That's Jesus. They show zero hesitation or embarrassment. The Nephites don't go, well, you know, Hezekiah did smash it up, but like, but let's remember there's some, no, it's Jesus that Hezekiah smashed. Now we'll come back to the. I want to talk about Isaiah in a minute, but let's but let's talk about Hezekiah, okay? And these reformers, because there's this wonderful comparison that I think is so telling. And I, I'm not looking at my scriptures. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the comparison. You can go look it up on your own, because I think you're kind of like an hour, hour and fifteen minute show, right? So we're already like halfway done. Oh, we so, can keep going. Don't you worry about that. Okay. And we, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, we can go three hours, no problem. Uh, okay. <laughs> Second Kings 18, 4 and 5. The setup is, oh, people are wicked in the days of he King Hezekiah. They are idolaters. They are not following the correct religion. What do we do? We smash up their stuff. Okay. And we smash up the serpent in the pole who is Jesus. We also smash up the groves. Now, I want to come back and talk about that in a bit. Okay. What's the result? Verse 5 says, he was the best king ever. There was not one before like him nor after. Okay. Now, it turns out there is another king of Judah who gets similar discussion. Okay. He, he also, King Josiah, was also the best king ever. Chapter 2 Kings 23, I forget the verse, but I think it's 2325 maybe. Okay. Late in verse, in chapter 23. Again, Josiah, just like Hezekiah, the best ever. Why? Well, in his day, there was a similar problem. The similar problem is there are people who are not doing the religion right. What is the answer? We should go smash all their stuff. We should break their houses down and smash their altars, and we should put human bones on them to defile them. And while we're at it, let's kill them. That's what 2 Kings 23 praises Josiah for, is murdering people. Now, even forgetting about who he's killing, okay, because there's a lot of indications in there that maybe he's killing people who, who are not necessarily people who should, we should want to kill. Okay, so the whole, uh, I think the King James says they're male prostitutes. Isn't that what the King James translates them as? Yeah. Really? Hebrew says this is historical slander. The Hebrew does not say they're male prostitutes. It says they are holy ones. Mm -hmm. So he smashes up the houses of the holy ones. He kills the Kamarim, who are, who are again, the translation is idolatrous priests. We have no reason to think they're idolatrous. In the mm -hmm. Syriac translation of the Old Testament, Melchizedek is, is indicated as one of the Kamarim. So, mm -hmm. so Josiah 
goes after the the priests associated with, with Melchizedek. He goes after the Holy One. He smashes up stuff, everyone who disagrees with him, and he kills the local priests. And he was the greatest king who ever lived in Judah. None before him, none after were as great, right? This is the people who assembled the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. This was their ideal. Now, go look at Alma 13. And I forget what the verses are. I want to say it's like 17 to 19. And I think they are in there very deliberately. Alma is discussing a very similar situation in the reign of Melchizedek. Okay. Uh, and, and he says there was great wickedness in his day. I think maybe he says there was idolatry. People are doing religion wrong. Oh, we know the answer, right? He should go smash all their stuff and he should kill people. But that's not what Melchizedek does. It says that he goes and he preaches repentance and tells his people repent. And it says that he established peace in his day. And Alma says, for that reason, he was the greatest king. There was none before him and none after who was greater. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think that's what we're dealing with, is that the people who assembled the Old Testament, who we still take at face value at Sunday school, praise murderers. These are the best kings ever. Despite the fact that Alma says no. That's not what a great king does. In that same circumstance, what Melchizedek did, did was preach repentance. Mm. Okay. Now, so that's who that's who the Nephite prophets are: the vision, the visionary men, the uh, children of God, uh, the peaceable followers of Christ. These are all phrases they use to describe themselves. Can we talk about Isaiah just a little bit? Please do. We love okay. Isaiah here. I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm going to tell you a story about Margaret Barker first, okay? This is going to sound like it's a story about me, but it's like about, oh my gosh, a crazy thing happened. <laughs> so I go shortly after I wrote the first two books in 2012, uh, Logan, Utah, it's the first Academy for Temple Studies or whatever the name of it is, something like that, um, annual summit. I forget what they call it. And um, Margaret speaks. And uh, they say, hey, listen, um, after the her presentation, Margaret will take questions. So if you uh, write a question on a three by five card, we'll give them to her and, and she'll answer a few questions if she can. So I thought, okay, this is my chance. Mm -hmm. So I filled both sides of a three by five card out. And I said, um, you talk about how some words may be stand-ins uh, for a divine feminine presence, including, for example, wisdom. Have you considered the possibility that counsel in Hebrew at sa is a stand-in for the divine feminine presence? For instance, in Isaiah 5, chapter 19, and I filled both sides of the card out and Put my email address, which I have a very crazy sounding email address. So that alone might have worked <laughs> wrong. And um and I sent in the card. And she did not read my question. And I thought, well, shoot, I took my shot. But then about two days later, she emailed me to say, I think you're right. And I e emailed her one of my books. And I said, Yeah. Here's the bigger picture I think we're seeing there. Do, 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 do. Nothing the rest of the afternoon. The next morning, I, I get a new email from her. And the title of the email is, Your Amazing Book. <laughs> okay? And, and we start this conversation. And um, it, it's not that I have been in continuous conversation with Margaret since. But we have from time to time. Right. And then when the great lady came out late last year, I was reading it this spring and got to her discussion about Isaiah and his disciples and found myself in a footnote. Mm. Okay. And that, by way, that's that's a story about, wow, what a fun adventure I had. But by way of saying what I'm about to tell you is the thing that got Margaret Barker's attention. OK. OK, we're ready. OK, here's where I think it starts. Hezekiah is a bad man. 
Hezekiah smashes the Jesus of the temple. Okay. The other thing he does, and the thing that Josiah also does, is they destroy the Asherah. Uh, what is the Asherah? Should should I assume some knowledge on your listeners' parts, or should I assume none? What do you What do you think? Yes and no. Go ahead and cover it, just for those who are new. Okay. So if you look Asherah up in a Bible dictionary, you will be told that she was a pagan goddess. Her name appears repeatedly in the Old Testament, but it's not visible in the King James because it's translated as the groves. Okay. Um, but we know she was popular for a lot of reasons. We have found thousands of little clay figurines of her. And and they're um the the clay figurines of the goddess of Jerusalem and Judah in the time of Isaiah and Lehi are different from the figurines of the surrounding nations. They're not just some goddess. They're distinctive. And they're distinctive in that their lower half appears to be a tree trunk. It looks like a woman tree, right? It's not sort of voluptuous upper body and lower body like you have for Phoenicians or whatever, okay? It's a, a sort of a woman tree. This is not me saying this. This is a commonplace, like Biblical scholars look at it and go, that is a woman tree. It is a woman pole. It's one of the reasons they think that this is Asherah, because Asherah is a sacred tree or a sacred pole. But we also have writings. Um, we have uh, at Kuntilet Adrut and at Kirbet El Kom, we have inscription, we have uh, uh, graffiti and, and uh, written on pithoi on jars or scratched into the wall that refer to Yahweh. Now, how you read it exactly. There's different ways to read it, but but most people think it's Yahweh and his Asherah. And at this point, the debate is basically over. In some way, more or less, those writings all indicate that for some significant number of worshipers, uh, again, in the time from Lehi or Isaiah down to Lehi, Yahweh and Asherah went together. And that was an unremarkable statement of piety to say, may Yahweh and his Asherah bless you, right? May Yahweh and his Asherah bless me. Um, we have the evidence of the Old Testament itself. Why would why would Hezekiah deserve so much praise for smashing up the Asherah unless it was like a hard thing to do, unless it was the fact that there were a bunch of people who thought he shouldn't do it, right? If it was just a casual house cleaning, no big deal, not controversial, it wouldn't even have made the text. It makes the text because it's a big change, right? Again, mm -hmm. Lehi and Nephi both in their visions of the tree of life, put the word happy right next to the tree and happy Osher or Ashreka in the beatitude formula, blessed art thou Nephi, uh, seems to be a pun on the name, on the name Asherah. Mm -hmm. Hezekiah destroys the, uh, the representation of the goddess in the Jerusalem temple. It says he cut it down, Karat, he cut it down. We don't know we don't know exactly what that means. Uh, we, uh, secular scholarship, do not know exactly what that means. But I think I know what it means. Mm. I think Isaiah tells us. I think actually he shows a pretty vivid picture. And um, and it's in Isaiah 5 with a little corroboration from Isaiah 3. Okay. Now, these are there's a lot to say about this. Okay, I did talk for about two hours about this in another podcast. I have a lengthy, really two whole chapters about this in the book coming out in, in March. I'm just going to, or in May, I'm just going to jump right into the heart. And I'm going to point out just a couple things. Okay, the, the, the heart of this um, dark, dark episode. So, um, First of all, in Isaiah 3, when, ne uh, when Isaiah is talking about the apostasy in his day, he says about the sinners, they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Okay? That has reference to the thing I'm about to tell you. It is not about homosexuals. It is also, for you Hugh Nibley followers, not about them being stingy. It is not either of those things. It's something real specific. Mm. They declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. 
Isaiah 5, again, he's describing the apostasy in his day. And there's a lot to say, but let me cut right to it. Isaiah 5, 18 to 20, okay? This is the most, the most pathos-filled passage I think we have in all of Scripture. And it's it's opaque. It's hard to read because we don't see what it's talking about. Uh, J.J.M. Roberts in his commentary on Isaiah says in verse eight of uh, verse eighteen, I can't figure out what sin it is they're committing here. <laughs> Isaiah says, um, you know what? I might actually read this just to make sure I'm getting it exactly right in its horrifying verbiage at least in the King James. Isaiah 5, 18 to 20, the worst thing ever. <clears throat> Isaiah is describing a scene. Again, I think this is in physical space. Okay, this is a thing he's seeing. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. J.J.M. Roberts says, well, what sin is it? They're just drawing a sin with a rope? No, the point is the sin is that they're drawing something with a rope. Okay, so Hezekiah's act of cutting down the Asherah is roping the Asherah and dragging it. Okay, what is this? This is a goddess. This is a woman who is a tree um, dragging it, dragging her, actually. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. It has been hidden until now. Okay, something that has been in secret, that has been hidden. We've thrown ropes around her, and we are dragging her out to be visible. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may see it, that we may know it. Excuse me, that we may know it. Now, <clears throat> counsel, this is, this is the verse I sent Margaret, okay? Counsel is etzah. Literally, that exact word is sometimes translated as, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6, 16, I think, is translated as trees. It's just trees. Usually it's translated as counsel. But the difference between the word etzah, counsel, and the word etz, which is the ordinary word for tree, is just the sound ah on the end. It's the letter he, which holds the sound ah, okay? Which just makes it feminine. So etzah, like, like Seuss is a horse, like a male horse. So, well, I guess we call it a stallion, whatever, right? Susa is a mare. Melech is a king. Malka is a queen. Etz is a tree. Etza is a tree woman, is a feminine tree. Let the tree of the Holy One of Israel come forth that we may know it, that we may know her, right? They've roped. Now, what is this? It's the menorah. The temple has a tree, okay? It's a great seven-branched tree. And as I said earlier, Matthew 7 First Nephi 8, Revelation 22, all put the tree behind the veil. The historical, again, I use scare quotes because I would rather say the propagandistic, okay, accounts in Kings and Chronicles claim that that menorah was in the center room, but the visionaries all put it in the back. But Isaiah is showing us the picture of the, of the lamp being dragged forward. Let the tree of the Holy One of Israel come out that we may know it. Ned-ah, that we may know it. Now remember, Isaiah 3, 7, he says, Their sin is as Sodom. They, they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. The sin of Sodom. And now I'm forgetting the verse. Genesis 19, 5, maybe. Is that when angels come to visit Lot, and they are in his house, the men of, men of Sodom say, send out your visitors that we may know them. And it is the same exact word, ned-ah, that we may know them. And knowledge has nothing to do with it. And this verse, which, which reads in the King James translation, and the King James were a bunch of Protestants. They were, they were blinkered to ideas about the divine feminine. They were trying to translate away from Mary all the time. Okay, 
they don't see they don't see what's going on here. So this sounds like uh, hurry up. We want to know the plan. Like this is why Robert's reason is like, what sin is this? I don't get the sin. Well, the sin is that there's an angel in the house and you are dragging her out with ropes to sexually assault her. That is what the sin is here. This is what Hezekiah did to cut down Karat, the Asherah. It wasn't sawing a log. He dragged the menorah out. And for Isaiah, it's such an intimate and violent assault. Now, verse 20. It says, woe unto them that call evil good. But actually, let me wind about Isaiah 3, 9, it's not just that they sin like Sodom. It's that they don't deny it. They declare their sin as Sodom. I think that is actually specifically a commentary on 2 Kings 18, 4. Hezekiah and his people are proud of what they did. Right? This, is, this, is the, this is the horror for Isaiah. <clears throat> Verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Now, this is moral confusion, okay? And by the way, um, knowing good from evil is at the heart of why Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Knowing good and evil are part of the uh, responsibility of the Davidic king, right? This is moral confusion, but it's not trivial. That put darkness, now put, put, not call, put, samim is the Hebrew. They move something. Mm -hmm. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They move the lamp. So that the Holy of Holies, which is supposed to be a place of light where there is the tree of the divine mother and there is the throne of God and they are standing upon the, the uh, foundation stone, becomes a dark cave. And the, hey, call which was supposed to be a dim place where you approach God through dimness and darkness and then are brought into the light. As Lehi says to his sons in 2 Nephi 1, awake, arise, throw off the chains, put on the armor of God, come out of obscurity into light. That's the imagery, moving from the hay call to the holy. Mm -hmm. place. They, they switch them. It becomes darkness in the defiled holy of holies that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is a little bit of a longer conversation, but I was going to highlight it here, okay? The river of Eden flows from the Holy of Holies out. And we see it in, ne in Lehi's dream. And there is water by the tree, and there is water in the center space, which is where the great and spacious building are. Mm -hmm. And there's a very strange thing that, that has gone almost unremarked which is that Nephi gives two different descriptions of the water. And in 1125, Nephi says the water is the same as the tree. It's the love of God. Mm -hmm. But when he's, but he, but he, but he, in his vision and also talking to his brothers, he says, he also says the water is the filthy gulf of hell. People who get led astray by the mists of darkness fall into it and drown. How can they both be true? Very easily very easily mm -hmm. because where the tree is the water is sweet and where the tree is not the water is bitter and so this is what we, we know this from exodus 15 okay after the song of the sea the end the last 10 verses or so of exodus 15 there are they come to the waters of mara the bitter waters okay and these are the same words in hebrew and isaiah and exodus the bitter waters, Moses gives God, uh, God gives Moses, haha, God gives Moses a tree, an etz, and he puts it in the bitter waters and they become sweet. The presence of the tree makes the water sweet. So when you move the tree, you switch bitter and sweet. Mm -hmm. And you make the waters of the Holy of Holies, the waters of paradise, the, uh, the waters of Eden, bitter when they should be sweet and the sweetening tree you've dragged out where she's not supposed to be out in the center room mm. so this this is i think the apostasy this is the real apostasy okay that's that's the thing we're trying to struggle to recover from is not a thing that happened 1800 years ago it's a thing that happened 2700 years ago 
And it's the thing that I think hovers over the entire Book of Mormon. And it is the thing that got Margaret Barker to respond to me and um, ultimately ultimately put that in a book written by a Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay. what I, Megan. There's like, there's so much here. Um, as you were talking through that whole dialogue, which was some, which was amazing. There's so much in there. I like, <laughs> And just trying to keep up with you, I'm like, I could go, you could go deep on any single one of these points. Um, so I'm very excited for your book. <laughs> I'm excited to read that more in depth. But the thing that stood out to me kind of from the beginning, and maybe I don't know if you knew that you were setting this up or not, um, is the principle of counterfeits. Hmm. So what you were talking about, about how in, in, was it in the Holy of Holies or it was in the temple that there were the two Nehushtanim. Nehushtanim. Yeah, I can't yeah, say that. Nehushtanim. Yeah. yeah. So there were two. And as you pointed out, that was very purposeful. Yeah. That there was a seraph that was representative of Jesus Christ. I think some scholars suggest that a seraph moving in a clockwise direction is kind of what they consider to be the righteous representation. And then there was a, and then there was a serpent um, that we know the Book of Mormon uses to identify as Satan, as the devil, right? So you have this law of opposition. And where do they put it? They put it in the Holy of Holies. They put it in the holy place. They put it in the, the place that is the penultimate, right? This is where we meet God. I think that there's a lot you could go into there about the eternal reality of the law of opposition, yeah. that this is something that is not just transitory. It's not only specific to this earth. It is literally a feature of eternity and we don't ever get away from it. There's never a point in time, perhaps, when it's just the good serpent. There's always the counterfeit as well. So with that kind of in the back of my mind, you started talking about them cutting down the groves. And when I hear cut, I think covenant. Hmm. Because anciently, a covenant was always cut. And so when you talked about cutting down the groves and then expanding on that, talking about how they prostituted out the symbol of our heavenly mother. They switched her. They put her in a space that is not her own and they put someone else in her place. All of that imagery leads, leads me to think of a corruption of the covenant of a false covenant of a false goddess that is set up in the place of the real one. And I think that that's actually consistent with the fountain of living pure waters that is identified as the love of God and the river of filthiness that you talked about too, that there is one that is true and there is one that is false and there's this duality. Now, the thing that <laughs> we don't have to dwell on this at all, but I think the thing that perhaps is most um, harrowing for me is a realization that prophecy is not only ever fulfilled once and that the prophet who were writing the Book of Mormon and Isaiah were writing about now. They used their day as a type and shadow to show us some of the things that were going to be happening again. But it strikes me as a very real thing that there is or has been or will be a corruption of covenant when it, when it comes to this topic, when it comes to an understanding of the Divine Mother. What do you... What, what say you? And your membership might be on the line. <laughs> I, I have no positions of responsibility. I'm mm -hmm. being an elders quorum teacher to an elders quorum secretary. That's the <laughs> first career. There's nothing they, that anyone can take away from me. Um, I, <laughs> I also have, said that too. <laughs> yeah. I also have no call to action. I like that. Yeah. I am nobody. Um, I have no academic qualifications that would impress anybody. I have no qual no column you should care about. I, re I realized about my 40th birthday, I was like, you know, the thing is, Dave, you're a weirdo and you're always going to be a weirdo and you're just going to have to get used to it. And I kind of got comfortable in my own skin at the age of 40. And all I can aspire to do is be God's weirdo. So that is what I am trying to do. Yeah. And, and I will tell you, um, you know, most of the time I live my, my life like it's just an ordinary, I don't go looking for signs. I just try to like make a living and try mm -hmm. and 
good dad and my kids and walk the dog and right that's i'm a very normal looking guy um but this year has been very strange uh i i wrote those first two books plain and precious things and the goodness of the mysteries in 2012 i basically caused them to exist and posted on a couple forums and that's all i did and over 12 years from time to time people would reach out and say hey would you come talk to my ward or my uh you know whatever my my study group and i, I would do it you know um mm -hmm. uh, Mike Day had me on his Talking Scripture podcast in mm -hmm. I think 2021, and that that blew up. But that seemed to be kind of a one-off event. And then all of a sudden in January, everybody and their dog wanted to talk to me. Out of nowhere, I had done nothing. And at the same time, uh, this is oversimplifying, but this is not that doesn't make it false, okay? Basically, my sort of secular career day job stuff all went into, uh, like all of it, simultaneously froze. It just paused. One of the few times in my life I have felt, okay, I am at this moment. This is a moment I'm here for. There is a thing God wants me to do. This is it. God has cleared the decks. So, okay. I've been thinking about this for 12 years. Wrote another book. Uh, I did, I wrote a book in February, hundred and ten thousand word book. Wrote it in February. Bam! It's coming out in May. It's I'm it's done. It's good. Um, I think God wants me to be doing this stuff. There is a warning. There is a passage in the Book of Mormon that I think we should take very seriously. That is, it's not hidden, like all of this stuff. Here's the thing, Megan, nothing is hidden. Everything is in plain sight. Everything is always being shouted from the rooftops. We're just not ready to see some things yet. And so we go to Sunday school and read them and don't get them. And read them and don't get them and read them. And, and then one day you go, wait a minute. Uh, and you suddenly realize what it means. Jacob chapter five. So, so Jacob has two big set pieces, two big sort of speeches in the Book of Mormon. Okay. The first one is 2 Nephi 6 through 10. And the way it goes, it starts up with like, hey, here's some discussion of the gathering of Israel. Then the big middle part of it has nothing to do with the gathering of Israel. It is about the ascent up through the straight and narrow gate. And it talks about being cast out of Eden. And it talks about resurrection. And it inverts the Beatitudes as curses. And it talks about Satan and hell. And it talks about asking, knocking, seeking, getting through the straight and narrow gate, building on the rock. It is the temple ascent. And then it winds up, bam, 2 Nephi 10, more uh, gathering of Israel. So there's like this gathering of Israel sandwich. But what's inside is all this temple stuff. Okay? That's 2 Nephi 6 through 10. Jacob 5 is the other big set piece, and it's the same sandwich. Because at the beginning it says, I will now quote Zenos, who talks about the gathering of Israel. Now go look at it. It mentions the gathering of Israel, I think, twice in verses 1 to 3, and then not again for the rest of the chapter. Because it's not about the gathering of Israel. But we get to chapter 6, and, oh, there we go. That's what Zenos said about the gathering of Israel. Do 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 Okay? There's this sandwich of the gathering of Israel around a real subject, which, again, is a temple subject. What is Jacob 5 about? Jacob 5 shows a three-part space. People go up and down this three-part space. That is a temple. Okay? That is... The Sermon on the Mount, that is Exodus 24, that is Jesus in the Last Supper, three-part vertical space is the temple. It is about the Lord of the vineyard and his servants who go down to the garden and then down into the nethermost parts of the garden and back up. And what are they doing? They're trying to bring down a tree. And the tree is four times back to back referred to as the mother tree. Go look in verses, I don't know, 65 to 68 or somewhere in there. Four times, back to back, quick succession, out of nowhere, bam, it's the mother tree. 
And there in the end, again, after you've gone through this big parable about the tree, which has nothing to do with the gathering and scattering of Israel. And I know some of your listeners are going to hear this and they'll be like, no, this is where Dave is an idiot. Dave jumped the shark. I know it's about the gathering of Israel. Think what you like. Okay. But Zenus or Jacob, right? Jacob says he's quoting Zenus. We don't know if he's tinkering with the words, whatever. Says that this tree oh, this is most desirable above any fruit. I think that's mm -hmm. the fruit, mm -hmm. which is all, almost exactly verbatim the same thing Lehi says about the fruit of the tree of life. It's the tree of life, the tree that the Lord of the vineyard and his servant are trying to bring down is the tree of life. That's what Jacob 5 is about. Well, why is it so damn hard? The parable says every time. This is from time to time we get it right. And then we get to lay up the fruit against, you know, the great and terrible day of the Lord. But most of the time, people get it wrong. And they talk about the wildness of the branches. And the wild branches overcome the strength of the roots. And you get wild, crazy fruit. And that's something we should be worried about. And it talks about sometimes it just dies. And that's something we have to be worried. And it dies despite the Lord of the vineyard and his servant dunging the tree about and nourishing it, taking care of it. And still they die. And it also, the, the word corruption, the word corrupt shows up about, I think about halfway through. What does the word corrupt mean? Well, if you, if you look up the word corrupt in the King James Bible, it appears 17 times. 12 of those references translate some form of the word shahat. So probably it's shahat. What is shahat? Can shahat refer to the corruption of vegetables? It can. It shows up in the in the Bible, fig trees and I think grapes or something. Okay, but also it is sexual corruption. So when the earth is corrupted because the sons of God sleep with the daughters of men in Genesis six, and we're probably this is some version of the story of the giants and the Nephilim. Okay, the earth is corrupt. Mm -hmm. It's connected with that sexual corruption. Okay. Also, when Moses comes down and they're worshiping at the golden calf, that, it, that what they're doing is corrupt. They've corrupted themselves. And it's, again, that shakat. So that shakat can mean sex. So that, that seems to be one of the warnings, too. And, and by the way, this is not historically wrong. Like the challenge with having, right, like, we, like you say, what do we do? Well, well, historically, by which I mean look the whole world over, okay? We, mm -hmm. The worship of divine feminine shows up when humans show up. Like it's been around. Often it gets associated with really corrupt practices, okay, mm -hmm. with things like mother-son incest or orgiastic practices or human sacrifice or castration mm -hmm. cults, right? So I, I think what the I think the parable is saying that. I think I, the wild fruit and the corruption is, man, for some reason, there is something about this that is essential and you must have it before the end. And also something about it, you cannot, you cannot get it right. You keep messing up humans mm -hmm. and, and you go wild in all these ways. Mm -hmm. And so that's not an answer making, right? That's just, that's just the question. That's the stakes. Like we we're supposed to, we're supposed to, I think there's this, I think the divine feminine presence is right there in the book of Mormon. It's right on the, it's, it's in their peripheral vision. You turn your head and it's always right there. And I can't quite look at it, but I think that somehow we have to get there. And I think there is this warning that we got to be real careful mm -hmm. because, because people get this wrong so much. Mm -hmm. you no. Know? And so the answer is not the castration cults, and the answer is not, you know, uh sexual licentiousness. And the answer that there, so what is the answer? That's the question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I don't know if this is a complete answer, but as you were talking about Jacob, um, and and this is a beautiful exposition of Jacob five. Uh, it resonates. It resonates really highly. Um, but you had me thinking about Jacob two. So in Jacob two, Marriage. Jacob is constrained to talk to. The people and he's so upset he's so upset that he has to talk to them and it's in this chapter that i think we get the scriptural or at least the book of mormon definitions for the word whoredoms and abominations and the associations of that but a couple of verses that i was just reading 
that really stand out to me. Um, and using these as a type of this broader lesson, right, that Jacob is trying to teach us, panning out, not just looking at it as a leader talking to a specific subset of people, but looking at it as Jesus Christ talking to those who are supposed to be his people, right? And he says, I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women. We always hear that and we're like, oh yeah, you women, you need to, you know, be chased, stop doing that, <laughs> right? But that's not the context of what he's talking about. In the context of what he's talking about, he's talking about men who exploit women. And he says, and these whoredoms are an abomination before me, thus saith the Lord. Wherefore, this people shall keep my commandments or cursed shall be the land for their sake. For I will raise up seed unto me. And when he says that, it's not just about people. Like he can populate, he can make these rocks children of Abraham, right? Like that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a covenant. He's talking about a righteous alignment up to God. Skipping down to verse 32, he says, I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people, which I have led out of the land of Jerusalem, shall come up unto me against the men of my people. And then talking about the Lamanites, right? Talking about their enemies, their grossest enemies. It says. It'll be better for them than for you. Because yeah. they, they love their wives and children or they, right? This is yes. the Nephite men are not respecting marriage. Uh, right. Justifying themselves on the basis of what they think of the practices of David and Solomon. Right. But if, But in the broader context, right? Stepping away from that, looking at it. I feel like this could be read as Jacob standing in for the Lord saying, look what you've done to your mother. Look what you've done to your sisters. Look what you've done to your daughters. They are sorrowing. They are weeping. You are not treating them. You are not giving them their space. You are harming them. You are, you are exploiting them. Right. And this is kind of the idea of this corrupt covenant. And, and I want to be clear, I don't have a call to action here too. Right. Like that is not at all what I'm intending to do. I just like to know the truth. Because I really want to live my life by that. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, we're going to corrupt something else. I think that you can make a fair case that we've just inherited a covenant that's been corrupt forever. And that can kind of fall under the first shall be last and the last shall be first prophecy, right? Where we have this righteous divine feminine, it gets corrupted. And then that corruption is passed on, right? Through the Gentiles. And then there's a restoration. There's a restoration at the end. And so I think that you could you could fairly make that covenant. Um, but it seems to me that all of these things really are a type, a type of corrupt covenant, abominations that we've inherited in our traditions and that we haven't set right yet. And that seems very sobering and, and very real to me. And I understand that there's an element of fear. I understand that people are very confused because as you pointed out in Isaiah, we have set good for evil and evil for good. And so when we think divine feminine, we think that over-sexualized, um, manipulative, conquering goddess, right? That false goddess, the Canaanite goddess. I think Ishtar is kind of who I would associate that with, right? That imagery. Um, and we haven't, but, but because we're getting caught on that, we're not, we're not exercising faith unto repentance enough in order to rid ourselves of that false ideology and turn back to the true mother. Which, as we've talked about, I think is, I think is, <laughs> I, I mean, is it fair to say that looking at the temple liturgy, having an association with our divine mother is requisite for eternal life? You mean like the temple liturgy as I read it in, Sermon on the Mount, et cetera. I mean, yeah, well, uh, well, I guess temple theology would be a better way of saying that. Man, I, I, I'm not sure. I, people say theology. I'm always not sure what they mean. <laughs> here, here, let me tell you what I think. Okay. Um, I think that there is a divine feminine. I think that there is a goddess. I think that the, uh, I think that the original Trinity that, um, with which Israel had an experience was a, a mother and a father and a son. You know, the eternal journey we are all on, uh, everybody's journey, whether you want it or not, is having been expelled from Eden and their presence. Can you return to get back into their presence? Mm -hmm. Matthew 7 says the straight and narrow gate leadeth to life. 
and then you pass through it and you're in the presence of the tree with good fruits that is it she is the mm -hmm. she is the tree of good fruits that is her kingdom mm -hmm. we our personal salvation quest um our ability to eat the fruit of the tree of life is somehow um and i and i say somehow but actually i think on on many levels in, including a literal level but i think also including on a psychological level mormon mormon addresses an audience in moroni 7:3 and and says you are in the rest of god now and you can stay in god's rest even until i meet you in heaven thereafter he's telling them they're in the holy of holies as he speaks to them even though the text says he's in a synagogue so a person a person can enter into eden psychologically a person can be in the kingdom of god and still be here among us mm -hmm. so I, I think that is a thing as well as um uh, that is a way of understanding this that is true, as it is true, I think, that we are mapping out our personal path, path of salvation and what happens um, after this life. Well, here's the recent exchange I had with Margaret. As I was finishing The Great Lady and read her chapters on the Beatitudes, I emailed her and I, and I said, hey, I love your reading. I say, if you, if you look at uh, the... Um, Beatitudes, you'll see there are seven blessings promised, which is this, the number seven is very significant. It is the number of branches of the menorah of the tree of life. It is the number, it is the number of the mother. You see over and over again in scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, you see in the Book of Mormon too, the number seven comes up. The number seven comes up in association with women in particular again and again is her number. She has seven branches. And um, I said, there's seven blessings promised. <clears throat> I said, but very interestingly, one of them is, is, is repeated twice. And that is, uh, uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I was writing Margaret because she pointed out that the word that is used to say kingdom in, the, uh, in Matthew uh, is Basileia, but actually one of the words for queen in that occurs in, in the Septuagint in Greek of the time is spelled exactly the same, Basileia. It's accented, accented in a different syllable, Basileia versus Basileia. Same word, you can't tell. The accents and even the spaces and punctuation are all modern, okay? In the ancient text, it was just a string of letters. So that those blessings could be read something like uh, there's blessed are the poor in spirit. There's is the queen of heaven. And I wrote her and I said, you know, I like the idea of seven. And I said, first of all, you can, the Greek is ambiguous because we, the King James translates that those verses as theirs is the kingdom of heaven, but actually it's a genitive. It can also mean Blessed are the poor in spirit, for of them is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, the kingdom of heaven is made up of the poor in spirit. Not that they get to inherit it, but mm -hmm. they are the kingdom. And I said, it's really interesting. It's lovely to me to think that on paper, you have what appears to be manifestly seven blessings. And I think it starts with the kingdom of heaven, and it, and it appears to end with the kingdom of heaven. And you go through these beatitude blessings. Um, which, by the way, are then all fulfilled in the course of the rite over Matthew 6 and 7, right? But the first one, I think, is not that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit, but they are the poor in spirit. And imagine then, knowing this is a text, and all, and thinking as a, as a young person that the last blessing was once again the kingdom of heaven, but you get to the right time and right place, and your, 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 your angel guide, the person who was leading you through this, changes the pronunciation, just changes the stress. And suddenly the, the, the repeated seventh blessing disappears. And there's a hidden eighth blessing, uh, which says, um, I think it's peacemakers, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the queen of heaven. And there's a hidden eighth blessing inside the list of seven blessings. And I wrote this to Margaret. And she emailed back and said, I see we are kindred spirits. 
I would say I think this is the problem of our age, but A, I think our age has lots of problems. And mm -hmm. also, I think that this has been the problem of uh, if Jacob every age. Is right. This has been the, <laughs> one of the basic problems of every age. It seems to be something that is baked into us. There's something. This is this is the fall. There's something about this that we that stops us from being in the presence of the tree of life. Something about us, mm -hmm. and that's the thing that we need to figure out and overcome. Mm. You know, it's so significant because I, I love how you described the number seven. We always think of it as being complete, whole, perfect. Um, but yeah, the association with women scripturally, you're right. Like you can't really get around that. But then moving and and seeing that there's a hidden eighth blessing. And my understanding is that eight is the number of Jesus Christ. And so you start to see just that principle that we talked about, that it is the mother and the son. It is the tree and the fruit. I was even thinking about, you know, you were saying she was considered a pole. So you've got the serpent and the pole. You have the tree of life and a rod, which could have been a pole or a branch. It seems to me that they're much more intertwined than we ever imagined. Also separate, right? Separate and equal. It's very difficult to pick them apart. So when Jesus Christ says, I am the life of the world, right? I think what he means is I'm the flame on the lamp, mm -hmm. not the lamp, because the lamp is the tree, and that's my mother. Mm -hmm. I am the I am the flame, but it, as you say, it is closely intertwined, and there are, there are people for sure who think, okay, Jesus is the tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This is this is a pushback I get in comments on some of these forums. People will say. Dave is wrong. The tree is Jesus. Um, often they will then say, because Elder Bednar says so. Mm -hmm. And and I think your point is exactly the right one. That, that the, the mother and her son, the tree and her fruit, are often presented as a whole. Mm -hmm. So unless a passage is trying to pick them apart to distinguish them, sometimes you can't. You have right. to look at it as a as a whole, the whole system to see ah, right. The lamp and the flame, the tree and the fruit, the mother and the son. Okay, yeah, yeah. which should make sense to us if we believe in covenant sealing, in two being made one. Right when you when you have achieved a state of being that is so synchronized with someone else, then you shouldn't be able to tell because you really are that that integrated with each other. As we wrap up, I felt to go to Isaiah 4, 1 and 2, given the discussion that we've had Where in the hopes we can take hold of one man. Yes. In the hopes that we can hear maybe a different interpretation than our very masculine society likes to give a lot of the time. It's not about polygamy. Uh, it is, uh, sorry, do you want to read the verse? I don't mean to cut yeah, you off. It's okay. So yeah, this is four, one and two. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. And in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Isaiah 3, 4, 5, 6 are Isaiah's calling narrative, okay? And they um, they provide recurring motifs that bind 3 and 4 together and recurring motifs that bind 5 and 6 together. And then they, they re repeat each other. Let me start with 5 and 6. You know the first word of Isaiah chapter 5 is in Hebrew? <laughs> I could guess. <laughs> it is... Ashira, which means, let me sing. May I sing? And Isaiah 6 ends with the word Assyria, which is a tenth, which sounds like Ashira, and with a bunch of tree imagery. And those images bind five and six together. Five is a discussion of the apostasy in Isaiah's day. Six is his calling. And it is the calling in which the sun, the serpent, comes down from the Holy of Holies and calls him. That's five and six. 
three and four are bound together by some repeated imagery. Three is an apostasy. This is the this is the chapter in which it says they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Okay, but um, there's a crisis of leadership. They try and grab a guy and make him a leader in the house of the father. He says, "Hey, don't I can't be a healer." Healer, by the way, like the serpent on a pole, or a priest who comes in the sign of the serpent on the pole. Okay, I can't be a heal healer. Why not? Because there's no bread, uh, and I have no clothing. Uh, and uh, but the righteous are assured that they will be able to eat the fruit anyway. The, and that language is all in three, which is the apostasy. Four is the response. And seven women take hold of one man and they say, we need someone to bear the name. We will provide the bread and the clothing, which are what's missing in chapter three. And again, the righteous are told they'll be able to eat the fruit. So who are the seven women? Well, I said women appear in the number seven again and again in the Old Testament. Miriam is cast out of the camp. She turns snow white, which is the color Nephi specifies for the tree of life. She's cast out for seven days. That's a hostile account to her that still acknowledges that she is connected with the tree of life. Uh, Bathsheba, daughter of the oath or daughter of seven. It reads exactly uh, the same way. Mary Magdalene, out of whom came not seven devils, but seven spirits. The, all the gospels call Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And if you only have the Gospels to look at and you were trying to figure out, well, who anoints Jesus? The only answer is women. Okay. And it seems women named Mary. Okay. And maybe a woman out of who come, whom come seven spirits. There are other examples. Women in the number seven. This is one of them. Seven women take hold of one man. And this is, this is the other vision of Isaiah's calling. Okay, it didn't happen twice. It only happened once. Was he called by the sun? Yes. Who was the seraph who came down from the Holy of Holies? And he also seems to have been called by the mother. He seems to have been called by the tree of life, by the seven-fold woman who, who, who seized him, provided the clothing and the bread so that he could be a healer, so that he could be a priest bearing the staff of the Nehushtan. Okay, now... What does that mean happened in physical space in 720 BC or 820 BC or whatever? I have no idea. I have no idea. I would love to know. People ask questions like, who would you like to have lunch with if you could have lunch with anybody? And they're thinking I'm going to say Bill Gates or something. No, Isaiah of Jerusalem. That's who man. I want to talk to. What happened, man? What did you really do? You know? Like, how were you called? But the in the vision, he is called by the by the mother and by the son. And that's what Isaiah 4, 1 and 2 are. Mm -hmm. And Hezekiah smashes both those things, for which he is uh, proclaimed the best king of Judah ever. Because there are men like you who are willing to look at this and, and willing to create the opportunity for us to realize that perhaps not all is well in Zion on this issue and that there is more to be done. There is more to be done. And I'm saying that you don't have to say anything. <laughs> Anybody who reads uh, Mormon chapter eight should be frightened. Yes. Book Mormon condemns us. And second Nephi 28. That's not written for non-members. Yeah. Well, Dave, this is a lot. This is heavy stuff. Yeah, I appreciate sorry. you wading into it and um and communicating it. So your book hopefully coming out in May, you said? May no, hopefully about it. It's done. May 1st. Okay. Uh the stick of Joseph Lads are mm -hmm. undertake to become a publishing enterprise. And I am their oh. first I'm their first attempt. So we'll oh see. Oh my goodness. So, They're yeah. crazy. I'll have to text Jackson and tell him how insane he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the language of Adam is the title. It'll be out May 1st. Beautiful. Well, I cannot wait to get my hands on that. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. And I pray that we can each really consider the things that you sent and that you said and um perhaps do some self-evaluating on where we need to realign ourselves 
to God and all that that entails. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Are you just reading the scriptures or have you learned to search them? If you haven't switched to using scripture notes, you haven't discovered the power of a tool designed for searching the scriptures. This incredible tool allows you to pull together search results from the standard works, apocryphal texts, and freedom documents into a collection you can study from. Digging deeper with instant references to Blue Letter Bible, the LDS Citation Index, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and more. You can even import your gospel library notes as well. Sign up now for a free trial at scripturenotes.com.